All right, Liberty Church, how are we doing today? You doing good? It's good seeing all of you guys. We're glad if you're here in the room and overflow watching online, we're glad that you're here as well. Come on, will you join me and welcome those that are online today? And I wanna ask you to do me a favor if you can, if everybody could just stand up, if you can real quick. I know you got situated and comfy, all right? Everybody stand up. I really feel like God wants to speak into our lives today. And you know, there's a, there's a parable that is in the Bible that talks about the, the word of God being like seed that's sown into soil. And it says that some of that seed produces what it's intended to produce, but there's others, other soil that isn't ready to receive it. And how many know that sometimes God will shock us and surprise us unexpectedly with things but then there's this, there's this description in that parable that says that sometimes the seed of God's word or the potential of God's word is snuffed out and choked out because of all the cares in our life. And I know if you're like me, you've got stuff, anybody got stuff going on in your life? You got cares and stuff. And so I just want just for a moment, just if we can, to do the work to make ourselves ready. You know, Jesus said, for those of you who have ears, let them listen. And he's not saying whether or not you can hear sound waves. He's saying if you're ready to respond and receive, then I'll speak and you'll, you'll listen. And I just wanna say this. I believe God wants to speak to you today. And I specifically wanna say this to the young people here. I believe God wants to speak into your life today. You're not here by accident. You're not here because your parents drug you here. You're here because God has something special for you. And I believe he can speak to you right where you're at. So can we just, if we can, just to pause and to try to remove distractions so we can focus. And I believe God wants to speak to us today. God, we thank you for your word. I thank you that it's on time, that it's a, it's a word that we need for this moment. It's not just a general statement. It's a, it's a word that we need. So we just declare that we need you and we need your, we don't need your plan. God, we don't even need uh, what you're wanting to do next. God, we just want you. And so God, I, I pray that in this moment, thank you that we'll be able to meet you. And then I pray that you'll speak into every, every life and every heart that's hungry to hear it today in Jesus name in Jesus name and everybody said amen. amen come on can we thank God in advance of his word today you can have a seat today we're going to conclude this series we've been in hope you've enjoyed it got a lot of feedback from it uh, next week we're beginning a new series on the book of James one of my favorite books of the Bible and the title of the, of the series is listen to my little brother and uh, if you didn't know James is Jesus his little brother he's got some things to say too and how many little brothers out there? Have you, anybody little brothers out there? Little brothers got something to say sometimes, all right? So I'm looking forward to that. But let me, let me end this series. How many of you remember when caller ID became a thing? All right, to the young people here, there was a time to where when the phone rang, it was like a, it was a surprise. You didn't know who was calling. And, you know, and there was only one line in the house. You may have had four phones, but everybody used the same line. Okay, so that meant if you had a sister, you never able to use the phone, all right? That was my experience. But I remember one Saturday morning, me and one of my buddies were playing, and uh, we were bored. And most bad stories happen when two little boys are bored. So we were bored. And, uh, and we made the decision, and it was something we did, honestly, from time to time when we were bored, and we decided to make prank phone calls. Honest moment, how many of you have ever made a prank phone call? Let me see, look at all these. You have? My son has? <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I discovered caller ID because we made a phone call to somebody, and I forget what we said, but then, of course, we hung up, and five seconds later, they called back. <laughs> Call our ID. And we've been filtering our communication ever since. Right. Is this somebody I want to pick up? Is this somebody I want to talk to? Is this somebody that I don't? Right? And now, of course, everybody's got a mobile phone, and now everybody in their mobile phone, you have a list of contacts. And so, and anytime someone calls your phone, how many know that you have two options? You can accept the call or you can decline the call. And generally speaking, when somebody, you know, obviously in your context, these are people that you know and are in your life, and so, you know, you can even filter those out. Are these really important people in my life or just somebody that has something they wanna talk about, right? Accept or decline, ignore. But then there's those times when your phone rings and you don't, they're not attached to a name. It's just a number. And how many know that the, the, the choices are pretty easy at that moment? I'm declining. 
And then until you become friends and now I know who you are, I'm gonna add you into my contact list so that when you call, I know it's you next time, right? Everybody get that? But now it's gonna step for, uh, further than just you know, who's on your contact list. Now they actually do the work where before someone calls, literally the phone can help you determine the motives of the person calling. I got a call this week and it's a call that I've gotten frequently and it hit me. And as soon as I looked at it, I knew this was something I wanted to talk about and I took a, here's a screen capture of that. <laughs> Come on, how many else on your phone, you get spam risk, just pops up. So somehow they have determined that whoever's calling you on the other line, they have something that you really need, <laughs> right? And of course, it's usually a telemarketer. Oh, I didn't know that I needed to extend my car's warranty, you know, what, whatever the situation is. So we know that a, a spam call or spam in general, it's not just a bad canned meat, which it is, but that's a different <laughs> subject, but. But spam is basically a, an unsolicited offer. Like you're not asking for it, they just, they just call. And usually it's, 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 it's usually set up as this is something you really need and I'm here to meet that need. But how many know more times than not, it really doesn't have much to do with what you need, but rather it's primarily about the person that's calling's need, that they're not... Though they say they're trying to give you something, in reality, what are they trying to do? Right, they're trying to get something from you. They're trying to take. And you know, we, we, some, you know whenever it calls, sometimes if I've got time, I play with telemarketers. You know, I just wanna, maybe if I just take up their time, maybe they won't call you. So sometimes if I have time, I just like to mess around with them. How many know not everybody that calls you has your best interest in mind? And can I just say this? This isn't just the, the people that are not in your contact list. Maybe it'd be good for us in this service today is pull out your phone and start looking through your contact list. Find that ex-boyfriend you know, that calls you up now and says, I was just thinking about you. How you know he ain't thinking about you? You know he's thinking about? Himself. Some of y'all need to pull up that contact and just change it to spam risk. So anytime it comes up, it's just... <laughs> Spam risk, ignore, all right? Or one of those old friends, someone that didn't like you to be bored on a Friday night, so they call you up, and you know, what are you doing? You know, it usually starts that way, but of course, they have something different in mind, and at the end of the night, you're like, man, why do I say, why do I always sign up for this? Why do I always do that, and I find myself in trouble? Come on, look them up. Spam risk, right there, all right. How about that person you don't talk to very often, but when you do, it seems like they call you to tell you about something you didn't otherwise know. Oftentimes about somebody else, and it's, it's kind of under the guise of I'm really concerned about this, and I think you need to be concerned about it as well, but really it's more about just spreading stuff and gossip. Spam risk. Right. Yeah. It's not just the messages that we get on our phone. I wish that... Every conversation we have and every message we see gives us a disclaimer to know the motives and the intentions behind the one that's communicating. What if before we watch the news, they gave a disclaimer that says the views expressed today do not reflect the shepherd that you follow? Warning, not every message we hear has our best interest in mind. And oftentimes it's presented that way, but it usually winds up leaving us short. And this is why in John 10, we've been talking about Jesus' metaphor of he's a shepherd and we're the sheep and his, his, his very narrow way of life. He provides an exclusive promise and he warns us that anybody else that offers you a promise that only he can deliver on, they're thieves and they're robbers. They approach you to give you something, but in the end, what they're really doing is they're gonna take stuff from you. And I, I care about you enough to tell you the truth. And I care about you. I, I'm, I may be the only one in your life that has your best interest in mind. And I'm not gonna play this game where everybody's just gonna tell you what you wanna hear, but I wanna tell you what you really need. And there's thieves and robbers. And he gives us this picture of a gate and a pen and their sheep and that's our relationship with him. And it says the thieves come over the fence. 
You can know if they have your best interest if they come through the gate. I'm the gate. But how many discover that not all thieves come through the window? Not all thieves break in through the window. Sometimes they come through your front door. I remember one Sunday morning, I woke up and was getting ready to come to church and I got in my car and I looked around and my car was a mess. And not the normal kind of mess. It's usually in a mess, but it was a different kind of mess. The glove compartment was open, the center console was open and everything was thrown everywhere and I quickly realized somebody's been in my car in the middle of the night in my driveway. So I looked around and I realized they took my backpack, had my laptop in it, took an iPod, you know, back when we had those things called the police, they came there and they looked and they got a list of all the things that they took from me. They're dusting for fingerprints and they're trying to figure out, did they pop a lock, did they bust a window? And the police officer said, we can't determine how this thief got in to your car. And I said, I think I know. <laughs> the doors were unlocked, right? So in his mind, maybe he's just like, oh, you just wanted me to have it, I don't know. I'll just take whatever you give me. Sometimes thieves don't come in through the fence. But this is what Jesus is warning us about, that there's people that are influencing and have, a, have an opinion about your life, but they don't have, a, have your best interest. This is why he starts John 10 by, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. I'm a truth teller. Sometimes it's the truth we don't wanna hear. But let's back up. I'm gonna look at John 10, verse two. John 10, two says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. We can know that he's our shepherd because he's not jumping over the fence. He's not coming in late at night. He comes through the opening. He's got, a, he's got the key to unlock the door. Shepherd being Jesus. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. Everybody say by name. By name. And leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own sheep, he goes on ahead of him, ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. I recognize that voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. And what Jesus is saying is there's all kinds of people that have opinions around you about what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing, what's okay, what's not okay. Okay, they're the thieves and robbers, spam risk. They're trying to take something from you, all right? I've come to tell you the truth. And he says this amazing thing. He says, my sheep, I know them by name. I know them individually. I know them intimately. I'm aware of their tendencies. This one wanders off when I turn my back. <laughs> this one stays in. I know their inclinations. I know their challenges. I know their temptations. I know their struggles. I know them by name. He knows you by name. How many know that when he looks at Liberty Church, he doesn't see Liberty Church and this logo on the building? No, no, he sees individuals. I know them by name. He knows you by name. But there's strangers that come in and they speak, but the ones that he knows and the ones that know him, they don't listen to a stranger's voice because they, they, they know. And here's why I'm saying this, is that discerning the voice of God is the difference, and let me say it this way, is the difference between life and life. It's the difference between, it's, it can be the difference between life and death, but let me say this. It's the difference between life and life. When the Bible in John 10 talks about life, zoe life, it's different than bios. Bios just means heart, heart's beating, lungs breathing, upright, not six foot under, you're alive, all right? Zoe life is a life that's connected to God in a practical way that's marked by abundance and genuine or the real thing. And the voices that we hear have a tendency to shape who we ultimately become and what we do. And this is why, if I wanna just finish on this point, is that discerning God's voice and hearing God's voice so central to us understanding what life is all about. Think about it. How many of you have ever heard God speak? Okay. I've never heard God speak audibly. I've, I wished I could. I know people perhaps that can. I saw this meme about God's speaking audibly. Have you ever heard the audible voice of God? Yeah, when I read my Bible out loud. <laughs> I like that, all right? God's given us his word, all right? Let's just settle that. The Bible is the final authority. It doesn't matter whatever other opinion I have. It's sort of like the gate for everything else, okay? So, so that's a good thing, but now you have your Bible, but how many of your Bible doesn't address everything that you're dealing with? So how many of you have ever played when you're trying to figure out what God wants you to do, you play Bible roulette? 
Like you thumb through, you close your eyes and you find a page and you're like, this is what God wants for me. And you're like, that doesn't sound like anything that I'm dealing with, right? Or we say, God, give me a sign. If you want me to do this, it's important, speak to me. Anybody ever done that before? Here's a great meme to illustrate that as well. On the edge of a cliff, give me a sign. There's the thumbs up, right? <laughs> How many wish you could see that from time to time? I did that one time and I got this right here. <laughs> you know, I did the same thing. But God wants to speak to you. Yes, he speaks through his word, but he also wants to speak into your specific situation. I believe that wholeheartedly. And can I say this? Believing that God is a communicator, that he still speaks to us today, does not undermine the testimony of scripture. In fact, every page of your Bible is full of God speaking to his people individually. It strengthens the testimony of scripture. God wants to speak to you. And let me just say this. Let me begin where we started. The meaning of life is to know God. Okay, and it's not just the first week. It's like, if you don't get that, you don't get anything else. That the whole point of this is to have a relationship with God, to know God, to experience his goodness, to have an intimate relationship with him. And everything else that brings meaning in life, it depends on that main thing. To know his freedom or to know and experience the life that he intends for us. And today what I wanna talk about also comes from that and that is to know your calling. To know your calling to know the purpose for which God has called you. It's so important. That word called is the word kaleo, which means to call aloud or to call with a loud voice. It means to invite. It means to name by name. This is God's desire. He, he, wants, to, he wants to call you. He wants to invite you to himself, your unique and specific situation. And can I just say, he's got something he wants you to do. He's got something, he's got ideas, he's got an opinion about what it is that, that is meant for your life. And what I wanna do today is really reframe calling because many of us have really misunderstood what that means. But it's so important that we have. It's like one pastor said that the two most important days of your life is the day you were born and then the day that you find out why you were born. And maybe today's that day for, for some of you. When you're born and the day that you find out why you were born, just look at me for a second. I just, this is such an important message that we have to recapture in a society, especially among our young people now that we have paraded all kinds of ideas that have told them that they are accidents, they just happen because of chance over a long period of time that you came up out of an ooze, that you're not made with purpose and meaning, that you are not created by a creator, that you're just a coincidence that happened over a long period of time. And that's just not the truth. The Bible tells us that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are made skillfully, even if the circumstance and the situation that brought you into being wasn't an accident, it wasn't according to a plan, but I want you to know that you are made by God's design and by his plan that he stamped the very image of God on the inside of you, that you matter, that you're significant, not because people think you matter, not because society says you're important, but because God deems you as valuable, as critical, and as important. <laughs> Ephesians 2.10, that you are his workmanship, you're his craftsmanship, that you are his masterpiece, that you are his poem, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he has prepared for you long ago, in advance of you being alive, in advance of you being conceived, before you took your first breath, God already had something specific and unique for you to do in the earth and in the world. That's where life is really ultimately found. What God put in you, he hadn't put in anybody else. And it is essential and it's critical to know what it is that he's put inside of you. But can I also say this? That you knowing your calling is not just good for you, but it's good for me. Because the calling, the things that God has placed in your heart is not just for you to be used so that you can be important, but it's, you, it's given to you for my benefit and for your benefit and for everybody around you and your benefit. Look at your neighbor and say, I need what God put in you. I need it. I need it. Peter says, that God's given these graces in various forms. Whatever, God, whatever gift you have received, use it to serve others. 
that God has chosen uniquely and specifically, that he has given things to us. Ephesians tells us that the body of Christ, that the church, that his church is built up and is strong, not because they got a good worship leader and they got a good pastor or preacher, but it says that the body builds itself up in love as each part of that body does their work. That's you. Liberty Church will not be what it's meant to be until you know your calling, until you walk in your calling. This community will not be what it's meant to be until you know your calling, until you walk in your calling. It's consequential. It's so critical that we understand and we know. What you do matters, it's essential, okay? I love this meme right here. I'm not saying I'm a big deal, but the government classifies me as essential, all right? (laughs) Can we just give it up for all the healthcare workers? Come on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes the things that we see as optional are really essential. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a big deal. Go ahead, you're a big deal. (laughs) You're a big deal. You're a big deal. I wanna speak to those of you in this room that, that don't feel like you matter, that feel small, maybe disappointed, or maybe even this song, it's like I had my moment and I missed it. I love that song that says, God's not done with me yet. If you're here today, I don't know what season you're staring down. God's got something specific for you today. It's not somewhere out there or it's not somewhere back when, but it's right now. It's right in front of you. And here's the challenge. There's something that aches on the inside of us to want to be important, to want to live a significant life. But oftentimes we confuse doing something important with feeling important. And oftentimes those are two different things. It's an age old dilemma. There's this amazing account. In fact, it's, it's said multiple times where some of, it, some of Jesus' disciples, they came to him and one, it says that an argument broke out among the disciples in Luke chapter nine, I believe it is, arguing among themselves about Jesus, help us to determine who is the greatest. See, sometimes it's, it's great by comparison. It's not that I wanna be important, I just wanna be more important. It's not that I wanna be great, I wanna feel like the greatest, right? It's okay that, I don't, that, I'm not, that, that I feel small, I just don't wanna be the smallest. So we compare ourselves, and this is happening. He's basically saying, Jesus, tell us which one's the best Christian. Who's the best Christian among us? Who's the most capable leader? In fact, in another place, it says, which one of, can we sit on your right and your left hand? Can we be seen and be prominent when you enter your kingdom? And, and this is the dilemma that we all find ourselves in. And we we live in a society that kind of fans that into flame about there's something in us. There's a a need for self-importance. And oftentimes what we do with calling is we take, you know, this basically self-worth mantra, this selfish ambition, and we, we just wrap it in Christian cliches. God's got something great. He's got something big for you to do. He's got something amazing. But what we interpret that is, is I wanna feel important. I wanna feel significant. And we live in a society that obsesses over celebrity without substance, where lots of our icons and our idols honestly earn their status pretending and acting to be somebody that they're not. And then we're shocked and and, and surprised to find out that the real person behind the mask and behind the act isn't always somebody that we wanna be like. We have confused important with impressive. We have confused important with impressive. And this is why maybe so many of us, we feel so small. It's not that we're not doing important things. It just isn't impressive. But maybe God hadn't called us impressive. Maybe he's called us to something bigger. Maybe he's called us to do something more significant. There's a difference between impressive and important. Here's the deal. Some of us in this room, we feel small and unsuccessful. We feel small and we feel unsuccessful. But here's the dilemma. There's other people in this room. You feel successful and yet you feel small. We have, we have acquired, we, we've obtained, we've accomplished, we've succeeded. And, but here's the deal, because there's something on the inside of us that we oftentimes try to meet with accomplishment and notoriety by being noticed and being seen and by feeling important. 
But here's the deal. This is something that's absolutely critical for us to know. You cannot out-succeed your insecurity. You cannot, no matter how much success you have. If there's something broken here, if there's something broken on the inside of us, and I'm not pointing my finger, all of us have this dilemma, this internal dilemma that we try to meet and resolve and solve with external things, and then we find ourselves surprised and shocked when it doesn't meet and satisfy the need. And it doesn't matter how much we have. It doesn't ha matter how well known we are. We all find ourselves in that same place. This is why Ecclesiastes, you know, this book that talks about meaning where he says, I've surveyed the people that I know in my own personal experience. Solomon was the wealthiest person that ever lived, smartest guy that ever lived, position of power, had pleasure, whatever he wanted, he did. And he says, I've surveyed and I've discovered that all of life is meaningless. It's like a chasing after the wind, which means we're trying to grab something we can't get a hold of. We find ourselves empty handed and surprised. And he finishes this book, the whole book sums up with this simple statement. So now you don't have to read the book of Ecclesiastes. Here's it. No, go read it. But here's how, here's how he ends. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. It's not in all the stuff we chase. All that glitters is not gold. Anybody discovered that? Right? He's saying here's the point of all this is to know God in a real way and do what he says. That's the meaning of life. To know God in a real way and to do what he said. Some of us, we look at what God has asked us to do and we compare ourselves to other people and we think, I, you know, he's called you to do this and me to do that and that makes me feel inferior, makes you feel superior or superior, inferior. And we miss the point. It, it really has everything to do with who's assigning the task. Sometimes we miss that. Can I just say this? The size of your assignment doesn't determine the level of your significance. Whatever God gives you is what makes it significant. And I, I realize this, I've realized this many times, I think this is so important. I remember recently I was walking on a, on a beach and usually when I'm doing that, I'm not exercising, I'm usually praying. And honestly, I've found myself walking on long, empty stretches of beaches a lot lately. And when I do in that moment, what I'm doing is I'm wrestling through the challenges in my life in dealing, trying to cast my cares on the Lord. And this is, you've probably all been there too, where things don't go the way that you thought they should go and you don't know what to do with it. Say, so I just gotta go for a walk and I gotta, I gotta vent a little bit. It sounds sometimes like it's just, you know, you're just venting on God and why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that? And Right, anybody ever been there before? And it's in that moment that I'm saying, well, you told me to do this and I did it and it didn't happen like it was supposed to. And then it's like I heard just in that moment, it's like the Holy Spirit just says, didn't I tell you to do it? I'm like, yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah. And in that moment, it's just like an aha moment. It's like the meaning, the thing that I'm doing is not because it works. It's not because it's successful. Is that the secret is with the assigner and not the assignment. Yeah, you, you said it. You mean to tell me that you're getting caught up over your little plan not working out and you're having a conversation with the same God who spoke every star into existence? Have you missed the point here? And in, and in that moment, I realized something that God values things differently than we do. And all I could see was disappointment, but all he could see was success because the reality is this. If it went according to my plan, you know where I'd be that day? You wouldn't be walking on a beach with God. <laughs> there's a psalm that says that he is close to the brokenhearted, that he saves those who are crushed in spirit. It's a statement that says that God steps in when we come to the end of ourselves, when things happen that we didn't see happen, that he, he's close to us. And I pray all the time for God's closeness in my life, probably you do as well, and sometimes I believe he answers that prayer by not allowing things to go according to my plan. Because I don't know that it's necessarily God so far away that he comes close but I know in that moment what happens is I go to where he's at. It's not that he comes to where I'm at. Maybe we misunderstand it. Here's the deal. Your calling is the conversation. You're called to the conversation. You're called to the caller. 
You're called to be in relationship with God. It really is immaterial. It's secondary what God actually asks you to do, but instead to be blown away that he asks you for anything. Who am I (laughs) that you're mindful of me? Second, your calling is dependence. Your calling is dependence. If we were to be honest, if God heard all of our prayers and he answered our prayers and the plans worked out the way that we thought they should work out, we'd be at a place of comfort, but we'd be separated and isolated from God. We wouldn't need him. We're basically saying, God, if you could take care of that, then I won't need you so much. He said, no, 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 that's not my plan for you at all. And I, I just wanna encourage those who are disappointed those who have honestly said yes to what God is asking you to do and you stepped out and you're like, why didn't it work? Can I just remind you that that wasn't the point? There's a statement that's made in the book of Jeremiah. You know, God rose Jeremiah up to be a prophet to the nations. I have something for you to do, Jeremiah. Go and prophesy to these people. Speak to the people. Stand before the people. But here's a statement, Jeremiah 7, 27, God speaking to Jeremiah. When you tell them all this, they will not listen to you. <laughs> when you call to them, they will not answer. Sometimes God's ask, God asks us to do something he already knows isn't gonna work. You know, when God asked you to write a book, maybe it wasn't because everybody needed to hear it. Maybe it was you that needed it. Maybe God called you to go on a mission trip and to go to Central America, and it wasn't because those people there needed something that you have. Maybe he called you there because they got something that you need. This is what calling is. It's not like, here's your roadmap to success. No, 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 no. You're called, you're called to the challenge. That's what you're called to. I know a lot of people that are doing their dead level best to serve God, to honor him with their life. And every one of them I know have discovered as they stepped out on that path, have realized it was, it cost them a lot more than they thought it would. It was gonna be, it was way more difficult than they imagined. It was gonna take a longer period of time. Every one of them, without exception, there is no, I don't know anybody that's serving God right where he's called them to be without wrestling through the challenge. And here's the deal, what happens is that Calling is less about an assignment and it's more about what God does in you. God using, maybe he told me to go there because it wasn't something I had to give, but there was something that I couldn't get any other way. I've joked about this several times. You know, I believe one of the reasons God called me to be a pastor is because he couldn't get me to study the Bible any other way. He said, this is for you. The challenge that you're walking through is for you. And if that's the case, I just want you to encourage, if it feels like it hadn't worked out like you thought it would, that doesn't mean that it's a failure. God is working something in you. Some of us have this idea that God's call for my life is somewhere out there, somewhere around the corner in the next season of my life. If God would just hear my prayer, maybe you as a pastor would just recognize my gift and what I could contribute. And whenever you do, then I'll walk in my calling. But I just want you to know that God's will for you is whatever. It's whatever. I love the word in Colossians. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you're serving God, not human masters. That means if I hate my job, whatever I find myself doing, it becomes God's will if I give my everything to it. My goodness, the season you're in right now is called your life and he has something specific in this season. The scripture says that if you're faithful with the little, he'll what? He'll give you much. But here's the deal, what we do with that scripture is say, if I do this, the stuff that I don't wanna do, then I'm gonna get the things that I really want. He said, no, 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 no. Here's what happens along the way, is as you're faithful with what he has, with whatever, wherever, whenever, is that you end up there and you realize that what you needed all the time is to be faithful in this season. And what happens if we're not careful is we get to that season and we ain't ready for it and it crushes us along the way. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Last one, your calling is obedience. Your calling's obedience, period. It it really is not about outcomes. It really is not about plans. It's, It's just, God, you've told me to do this, I'm going to do it. It's about obedience. 
I remember some years ago, a friend of mine, I got to see his calling unfold. And I knew him, and so I knew part of his story was as a young child, God did supernatural amazing things in his life and spoke to his life at a young age about what he prepared for his future. And that God called him to pastor a church and to start a church specifically. And I remember I got to go to the first service he held at the church that he planted that he waited his whole life for. So I wanted to go and support him. I was there and, you know, it was a great service. You know, people gathered and heard him cast a vision and share his heart. Service was over. I was like, man, that was awesome. It's so good to be there to celebrate that. Walk over to my friend and when he's there, he's talking to a lady. And so I wait for him to finish the conversation. He finishes talking to her and he turns and he sees me. And I just give him a big hug, man, I'm so proud. I'm so excited to be here with you. So glad I was able to celebrate this. And he's like, yeah, it's so awesome. The lady I just talked to, she just gave her life to Jesus. And I was like, amazing. You know, so we just celebrated in that moment, but then we spent the next two to three hours together to where he basically was disappointed in what happened. There wasn't enough people there in his mind. It wasn't like he imagined it to be. He imagined it to be something completely different. He imagined speaking a different message and people responding in a different way. And it was in that moment that I realized how easy it is for all of us. This isn't a critique of him, but to say, sometimes we value things differently. Maybe God spoke to you as a five-year-old boy to put a passion and a burden in your heart to pursue and to know God. Maybe he did supernatural things your whole life to get you to this point for that one lady that we just thought, well, that's not impressive because we want something important. That's where so many of us are. That's where I'm at. I mean, know that there's a difference between impressive and important. Those of you who are in this room that are serving God, and you're like, what do I, it doesn't even matter. It matters. It's critical. God's asked you to do it. You've been faithful to it. Well done. When I get to heaven, I long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You know what I'm not gonna hear? You were a great pastor. You know, you had a big church. No, no, it's just well done faithful servant. That's all we're called to do, to know God and to obey. When those guys were arguing about who is the greatest, Jesus didn't chastise them for wanting to be great. He just reframed it. And he says, if you want to be great, good. And he brings over a kid and he says, you've got to change and be like a kid, a child. He had, they don't own anything. They haven't earned anything. They have no status. They're nobody largely in that society. You gotta change and be like them. If you wanna be great, if you wanna be first, you gotta become last. If you wanna be the great, it's okay. Become the servant of all. Same is true for you. Maybe, just maybe, God's got something great for you, but maybe he's got something better. You know, maybe obscurity is better than notoriety. (laughs) I'm, I'm afraid of notoriety. I prefer obscurity myself. I want you to bow your heads. I don't know what God's speaking to you and where you're at in your life. Just wanna encourage you where you are that God's got something for you. He's got something special for you. He's got something significant for you, but it may not be what you have in your mind. He's got a call on your life. He wants to speak into you and he wants you to depend on him every step of the way. So if you're here today and you're disappointed, disappointed, I understand, turn it into a conversation. And in that conversation, meet the one who called you and have your answer that you need. It's not in the solution, but it's in his presence. Depend on him, lean on him, look to him. That's where life is really at. That's where meaning is really found. He's got something for you. He wants to give it to you. Lord, I pray for every person that's here, confused about their calling, disappointed in their calling, overwhelmed by their calling, or just unknown, Lord. I pray that you speak into their situation, their life those that do not know you, don't have a relationship with you. I pray that their motivation wouldn't be to use you as a resource to get what what we want, to end up in life where we wanna be, but you, you're the end. You know, I love what Moses says. If you're not gonna be there and your presence isn't there, I don't wanna go. Wherever your presence is, that's where I wanna be. I pray that you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, can we thank God for his word today? (laughs) 